parliamentarians have bottled it. She needs to make it crystal clear. But unless we get some progress in the next couple of weeks, we're off. What's your exit deal with the EU? I wouldn't pay the EU anything. Right, we don't, so we're in the, the House of Lords, of which you so are a noble member, admitted in its own report that actually we have no legal obligation to pay a single penny. We came up with the expression, no deal is better than a bad deal. The reality is, WTO is a different type of deal. It's not no deal at all. It's how most other nations around the world operate. There's a huge opportunity if we leave without the terrible deal. We can take back control faster, sooner, and we can give much more certainty to business. Please welcome to the stage, Richard Tice. <laughs> Can you hear me in the stands? Thank you very much for coming. I know I'm not your favourite football team, but I have got some important news, ladies and gentlemen. You're all Brexiteers, hopefully. Many of you... Things are going well. And many of you, if not all of you, are supporters of Fylde Football Club. The good news is, with 15 minutes to go, you're 1-0 up. We'll try and give you a running commentary as to the score over the next 15 minutes. Um, anyway, uh, thank you very much for coming uh, to hear us this afternoon. Uh, I'm Richard Tice. I'm a businessman. I've set up small businesses, uh, run medium businesses, and indeed a large business that was listed on the stock market. I built thousands of homes, created tens of thousands of construction jobs, and brought hundreds of millions of pounds of investment into the UK economy. That's the day job. I sort of, and rightly or wrongly, and we all made mistakes, but I was only ever, until recently, a member of the Conservative Party. I know, I know. Um, I'm sorry. As I said, we all make mistakes. Um, until I accepted the invitation to be chairman of the new Brexit Party. Because frankly, and you'll see it from the high quality of speakers who are all candidates uh, to be elected to the uh, European Parliament. You'll see from, there are so many of us who've just said enough's enough. We cannot let this utter shambles, the way our country is run, continue any longer. We have been, the truth is, ladies and gentlemen, we have been utterly humiliated as a country and a great nation. Our Prime Minister has written not one, but two begging letters in the space of a fortnight asking overseas leaders and institutions as to how we should run and govern our country and our economy. And it's absolutely ludicrous. We've been humiliated by incompetent leadership, incapable negotiators, and frankly, MPs that want to do dirty dodgy backroom deals with each other because they're so worried about the threat that the new Brexit party is going to put on UK politics. We, it's unbelievable that these Westminster politicians, they think it's a good idea to sign the worst deal in history, what's now actually basically a treaty. And it is truly a shocking deal. No one in their right mind would sign that. And of course, they've all been advised by the civil service. Well, you know, that civil service has shown themselves to be completely and utterly not up to the job. And it's time for change. It's time for something different, ladies and gentlemen. It's time for the Brexit party. That's why it's vital. It's absolutely vital that all of us tell our friends, our family, anybody you know, we've got to vote in these European elections. It is so important. It's more important than ever. Because we all know that Brexit is a huge opportunity for this country. It's an opportunity to be, opportunity to be embraced with ambition, with enthusiasm, with aspiration, with confidence, and with belief in this great country. We at the Brexit Party, we stand for competent, common sense politics. There is so much we can do. 
the country is truly poised for change. Never has the appetite been stronger. Never, ladies and gentlemen, has the opportunity been greater for a new way of doing politics, a new way of running our country. Because with good quality people running our country, we can spend our taxpayers' cash better. We can invest it more wisely. We can make smarter decisions that will mean that actually we get the infrastructure and the public services that we truly want and that we deserve. So I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, before we welcome the first of our speakers, let's restore trust in democracy in this country because what they've done, what they've done over the last unbelievably nearly three years is relentlessly they have started to destroy the very most important foundation, democracy. And you'll hear about this later. <clears throat> so, we're gonna send, we're gonna send a very clear message to Westminster from all over the country in these European elections. We're gonna win, and we need to win big. And that message is that we know, with the right people and the right leadership, that everything, every opportunity is available to our great country. And that Brexit is a massive, massive opportunity. Because we, we Brexiteers, we believe in Britain. And... <clears throat> And our candidates for the Northwest region uh, of the European elections are a fantastic bunch. We're going to hear from them shortly. The first one, the first one uh, is an author. He's a TV commentator. He originally trained as a GP, so he knows about what's going on in the health service. He was actually, believe it or not, to those of you who remember um, John Craven and Newsround, our <laughs> Okay, I admit it too, I remember as well. Um, <clears throat> wasn't it fantastic? Um, so our first speaker, David Boy, he actually was the first health commentator for children on Newsround just a few years ago. So let's welcome to the stage, David Bull. <clears throat> Please welcome to the stage, David Bull. <laughs> Good afternoon. No, you can do better. Good afternoon. That's better. Hello, my name is Dr. David Bull. I am a medical doctor, I'm a television presenter, and I am an extremely passionate campaigner. Do you know, my whole uh, re remit for what I've done over the last 24 years is I've been fighting to improve the health of the nation. I have a very simple maxim. I believe that if I can give you as much information as you can, you can make really positive choices, not just about your health, but about the entire direction of your lives. And that's one of the reasons that I'm here today. Campaigning runs in my blood. I've been involved in some very, very big medical campaigns. I've been campaigning to clean up some of the filthy hospitals in this country. They are a disgrace. <laughs> I've been campaigning so that now every single child that is born in Britain is now screened for the life-threatening condition, cystic fibrosis. I have also been working very hard to improve the sexual health of young people. I wrote the government's, or the Conservative government's white paper on sexual health. I've been involved with elderly care. We need to treat older people with dignity, with respect, and that is not happening. <laughs> uh, 
And I want every single child in a state school in Britain to have at least one hot meal a day. Children are not being fed properly, and if they're not being fed properly, they cannot concentrate at school. But this, those are really important campaigns, but this campaign is the biggest campaign of my life because I am here because I believe we need to fight to respect the will of the British people. Because I think democracy is at stake. There is a fragmentation of democracy. And across the Northwest, when I'm here filming, talking to people, people are absolutely livid. They are very angry about what's going on. And it has united people across the political spectrum. People say to me all the time, my friends who are Remainers say, well, you didn't know what you were voting for. Well, we did. We did. We knew we were leaving the EU, the single market and the customs union. It was very clear. And everyone said they would respect the result of that referendum. So, we had the vote. It was amazing. The biggest democratic vote in the history of Britain. 17.4 million people voted. 3.5 million people in the North West. Nearly 60% here in Fylde actually voted to leave. And we thought we were leaving. But three years later, we haven't left. And why is that? The reason is that Westminster and politicians do not want us to leave across party. And it is simply not acceptable. They are doing everything they can to ensure that we don't leave. Theresa May has taken her deal back three times. After last night's local election, she will be determined to get it back a fourth time. Now, I can tell her as a doctor, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing time and time again and expecting a different result. So, Mrs May, Dr Bull is going to get his prescription pad out because you need some medication. I just very quickly want to say something about medicine. Lots of people are throwing around loads of lies and dishonesty and untruths about medicine. We are told the NHS, if we go to a WTO Brexit, the whole of the health system will collapse. There will be no drugs available. There will be no antibiotics. We are going to get the bubonic plague and all our limbs will drop off. This is what we are being told and it is nonsense and it is dangerous. As a doctor, I just want to tell you, because obviously health is very important to all of us, I want to tell you why that is the case. You see, medicine is global and it's very flexible. Firstly, we already trade with Europe. We import and export from Europe. It's a bilateral thing. They, it, we already conform to European standards and therefore a trade deal is very easy to do. Most pharmaceutical companies already have footprints in the EU and the UK. It's not an issue. This isn't about Europe, though. This is about the world. And if you look at the drug manufacturing around the world, let's look at one country, India. India makes a third of the world's medicines now, generic medicines. By 2050, they will make half of the world's medicines. So who would you rather do a deal with, India or Portugal? Make your own mind up about that. And if the EU doesn't want to sell drugs to us, we will go elsewhere. The United States has an abundant supply of drugs. We can import biosimilars and insulin and all sorts of other things because they're refrigerated. It is not an issue. Your health is not at stake if we leave with a clean WTO Brexit. Fundamentally, this is about democracy. We have to send a very strong message to people in Westminster that their time is up. This is a pivotal moment in British history. And you need to go from here and you need to say to them, this is the time that we change politics for good. Isn't it great? David Bull, ladies and gentlemen, he's a star.
he promised me that please do not talk about his tan. <laughs> so I won't say any more. Um, but I appreciate it's a bit chilly and we need a bit of audience participation. So, ladies and gentlemen, do we really believe in Brexit? Yeah. When do we want it? Yeah. I can't hear you. When do we want it? Yeah. Thank you very much. And you... you, you What's that? It's all go. So, um, our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is another specialist. Because as you've heard from David, he's got that fantastic knowledge about the health sector and the truth as opposed to the nonsense. But our next speaker is from the world of law. She's a very senior commercial lawyer. Indeed, her whole family, this is quite extraordinary, it's probably globally unique. Her two parents are both judges, and she has five siblings. And all six of the children are lawyers, so she is not to be messed with. <laughs> you can imagine the discussions around the kitchen table, can't you? <laughs> um, so, so she works for pharmaceutical companies. Uh, it's fantastic to have her with her. And again, it just shows the quality of the people that we've got as candidates who are prepared to put their head above the parapet with all the grief and the angst and the garbage on social media. But, you know, it's fantastic that Elizabeth here is prepared to stand as a candidate for the North West. So please give a very warm welcome, Elizabeth Babade. Please welcome to the stage, Elizabeth Babade. <laughs> Sorry to change the mood. I want you to imagine with me a prison. A comfortable, luxurious, international prison. <laughs> if I gave you a choice between moving from one part of this prison to a better part, or leaving the prison altogether, which would you choose? The Remainers would argue that generations unborn deserve the right to experience the freedom from moving from one cell of the prison to another without restrictions, no visas. We are here to present a better option leaving the prison with its super exotic cells. The Brexit party is about our right to leave prison. We want to leave. We know it's going to be rough in the short term as we get used to living in freedom again making our own friends, creating new networks, new local infrastructure, new trade deals, new policies, new industries. This will be hard. No one ever said it would be easy. But since when has the UK shied away from difficult challenges? Never. What the Remainers will fail to tell you is that the current EU membership is unsustainable in the long term. In the short term, staying in the EU looks very sexy. No visas, 
we get to travel the continent, drink Prosecco, do some wine tasting, speak French, German, Spanish. Think of all the wonderful things about Europe. And there are many. Let's face it, Europe is amazing. Amazing countries, amazing cultures, amazing people. We don't have a problem with Europe. It's the EU we have a problem with. The government structure of the EU is not only akin to prison, it's a slow death for our growth. For the EU to grow, the UK, the nation state we know as the United Kingdom, must gradually fade away. That's just it. In 46 years of European Communities membership, the UK has morphed from being an industrial nation to becoming a consumer nation. We don't even feed ourselves. Most of our food is imported. No country can grow like this. We are growing other economies at the expense of our own. You see, who does that? Who does that? <laughs> the reality is that consumer nations never grow. You can never grow by spending more than you earn. This is common sense. 80% of our local businesses do zero business with the EU. Yet they are 100% regulated by the EU. Most of our industries have been relocated by the EU to other EU countries where they are funded by the EU budget. Let's say you wanted to set up a new company today. Our current regulatory structure, mostly driven by the EU, would make it difficult for you to make profit. People talk about austerity. The best way to get out of austerity is by generating wealth. Be productive. Tweaking, rejigging taxes, it's not going to get us out of austerity. Successful nations have strong entrepreneurs. Thanks to the EU's policies and nth degree restrictions, most local businesses don't even bother. If we were free, we could focus on making this economy the economy of choice for entrepreneurs and small businesses. We could set up technology hubs that could compete with Silicon Valley rather than being an importer of technology. I want you, dare to dream with me. Envisage a new UK. But before we can get that new UK, we need to leave the prison. So it is time. 
to throw away the shackles of this very bad project. It is time to be free. On, on May the 23rd, get to the polls. Our very future depends on it. Get out and vote. If you've never voted before, vote this one time. If this is the only time you're ever gonna vote again, come out and vote. I know a lot of you are tired. You should be. But this one time, come out and vote. Because we need to be free. Thank you, everyone. Brilliant. Well done. Isn't she great? Give her a big hand. Brave, courageous, and a fantastic speaker. And what a great analogy about the prison. So to our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, from the world of business. He's an entrepreneur. He's been incredibly successful. And again, he's had the courage to say, actually, I've got to get involved. The country deserves to be run better by people who know what they're talking about. An entrepreneur in the world of technology and the world of property, please welcome to the stage, AJ Jagata. Please welcome to the stage, AJ Jagata. Hello, Brexiteers. It feels great to be here in file. I feel excited and energized. And I tell you what, I am so looking forward to the 23rd of May. Are you? But firstly, let me thank you, all of you, for the fantastic support you have shown all of the candidates. Thank you very much. It means a lot to us. So my name is AJ Jagota. I've created businesses in various sectors over the past 25 years. My parents came to Britain from India in the 50s. Thank you. I come from a working class family. Like many of us. My mother worked in a factory. My father working as a coal miner for 40 years. I have always been so grateful for the opportunities made available to me in this great country. Both my parents are lifelong Labour supporters. So imagine, imagine though, their surprise when their only son joined the Conservative Party. <laughs> and then imagine the shock when I was elected chairman of my local association. Yes, <laughs> indeed. You can imagine some of the interesting conversations and debates we had around the dinner table. But friends, in January, I resigned. <laughs> Thank you. 
frankly, I had had enough. Why had I come to this conclusion, you may ask? Well, friends, you may recall in 2016, we had a vote. 16.1 million voted to remain. Whilst 17.4 million of us voted to leave. Two hundred and forty two constituencies across this great nation voted to remain, whilst four hundred and six voted to leave. Three regions voted to remain, whilst nine regions voted to leave. So, all looks fine now, doesn't it? But my friends, in a faraway place called Westminster, there's a group, they call themselves MPs. They voted 160 to leave, whilst 486 of them voted to remain. Not only that, for the last three years, they have done everything to thwart that referendum result. That is why I decided to stand for the Brexit party. And like you, I stand up for democracy. We can change politics for the good. And why do we need to change this politics for good? I shall leave this with you. Let me tell you what the two-party system has given us. Some of you may remember this. And I want you to join in with me. They've given us nothing but this. For those at the back that can't see, it's fudge. <laughs> so with me, join in with me. What has the Conservative Party given us? Fudge. What has Theresa May given us? Fudge. What has the Labour Party given us? Fudge. And what has our friend Jeremy Corbyn given us? Fudge. I don't know about you. But I've had enough fudge for the last three years to last me a lifetime. So, my friends, we need to send a message loud and clear on May the 23rd to those people in that faraway land called Westminster. But you know what? We need your help. Not just on social media via your Twitter and your Snap Numpty, and not forgetting the Clegg book, remember him? <laughs> but more importantly, this is how we're going to win this. Talk to your family, talk to your friends, when you're in the pub, when you're on the bus, make sure on the 23rd of May that we all stand together for democracy. Remember, from the 23rd of May, there's only one party in town. It's the Brexit Party. Thank you. Brilliant. Well done. Isn't it great, ladies and gentlemen? AJ. I've got lots of good news. The most important news. Final score, 1-0. That's fantastic. In all the excitement of thinking about football scores and my concern as to how my club, Liverpool, will do this evening. I know. All right. I nearly forgot our launch video. 
when we launched the Brexit party just five weeks ago. So hopefully, if the technology works, just have a look at the screen and the launch video before we welcome our next speaker. We have been betrayed. That is why I set up the Brexit party. It's why we're going to fight the European elections on May the 23rd. And that is just the beginning of what is needed in this country. Democracy is under threat. And when politicians fail to deliver, there must be consequences. I was too young to vote in 2016, but now I support the Brexit party because I believe in delivering on democracy. It's time to recognise that actually we are an incredible nation. This isn't about left or right. We are standing up for our right to be heard. Successful, hardworking, so much to be confident, enthusiastic and optimistic about. That's why I'm supporting the Brexit party. We are a single nation. We wish to remain a nation. They must adhere to the promises made to the people. Let's be optimistic. And for the benefit of our children and grandchildren, if you want a home and you're a Brexiteer, you join the Brexit party now. can do so much better than currently we're getting from our members of parliament. We want to be an independent, self-governing nation, making its own laws, controlling its own borders, and being proud of who we are as a people. Join us, help us, support us, do what you can for us. We need change in this country, and we need it now. Britain needs the Brexit Party, and the Brexit Party needs you. More. More from our friend Nigel later, but our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, also needs little introduction. She's had a very distinguished and indeed varied career. The first phase, what I call the warm-up phase of her career, was to be a Member of Parliament for 23 years for some party that we no longer like to talk about. She then saw the light and became a TV celebrity. She taught some of us, myself included, how to dance when she went on Strictly Come Dancing. And then she went on Celebrity Big Brother. She's a true star, an absolute patriot. Before we welcome her to the stage, let's just see her on the video. We are in a complete mess. We've got the worst Prime Minister since Anthony Eden. We've got the worst leader of the opposition in the entire history of the Labour Party. And we've got the worst Parliament since Oliver Cromwell. And with that combination, we are actually engaged in the most important international negotiations for 50 years. No, let me finish this sentence, Adam, then over to you. There's a growing disengagement between the people and Parliament. And what I want is an overwhelming, an overwhelming uh, Brexit victory on May the 23rd. That we've seen. That's what I want. Please welcome to the stage, Anne Whittacombe. gentlemen, can Britain remain a member of the EU and control her own laws? No. Can Britain remain a member of the EU and control her own borders? No. Can Britain remember, remain a member of the EU and control her own trade deals? No. And can Britain remain a member of the EU and be governed by her own democratically elected government? No. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why we voted to leave in 2016. Those patronising nincompoops <laughs> say 
during their dinner parties. Oh, poor things. They didn't know what they were voting for. That was what we were voting for, for Britain to become a sovereign state. And anybody, anybody who voted Remain voted for Britain not to control her own destiny. What sort of Britain wants that for their country? So that is our answer. Now it isn't only the people who voted Remain, it's the people in Parliament. Supposedly the mother of parliaments, which is behaving like a nursery. <laughs> with everybody throwing their toys around, everybody trying to beat everybody else, everybody trying to get their own way and stamping their little feet if they can't. And yet, what is at stake? What is at stake here? It is the country's very future and they are squabbling like a bunch of kids instead of getting on and doing what the British people told them to do. <laughs> well, I have one very simple message for them. Either Britain leaves or they leave. <laughs> and when we say leave, we do mean leave. We don't mean standing there with one leg in and one leg out like some sort of crazed hokey cokey. <laughs> we mean being out. Yes. Now this country sent its political class last night one heck of a message and they have a choice they can listen to that message or they can do what I fear they may do which is cobble together a deal that actually means being in in all but name if we are in the single market we have not left if we are in a customs union, we have not left. And what we voted to do was to leave. And that is what we expect any deal to accomplish. No more obedience to their laws. No more slavery to their rules. No more having to accept whoever wants to come across our borders just because the EU says so. <laughs> and that is what this party is about. And if they don't deliver us, what we voted for in 2016. Then come the next general election, the Brexit party will take over Westminster. <laughs> and having taken over, we will do the one thing that we want to see done, which is that we honour the people's vote. Yeah. Otherwise, 
Otherwise, what is the point in voting? If government and opposition for that matter are simply going to ignore the results of a vote, why bother? So we will show them that we will ensure that they will not ignore the results of any vote, let alone a vote on a record turnout, a vote which produced a clear majority. Never has there been such a disconnect between Parliament and people. And this is now the time when we will ensure that the people win. Isn't she great? As I, as I said, ladies and gentlemen, you can't keep a good person down. And the truth is, she's now on phase three of her, her career. She's still just warming up. Thank you, Anne. And, and, so, and so to our next speaker, again, another entrepreneur who understands about negotiation. He understands about taking sensible risk, employing people, investing. He's an entrepreneur in the world of aviation and defense. And as you will see, ladies and gentlemen, he is without doubt this afternoon our most colorfully dressed speaker. Please welcome to the stage, Gary Harvey. Please welcome to the stage, Gary Harvey. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. You can see me. Good, good. I want to leave an impression. Okay, you've probably already detected from my accent that I'm not from the Northwest. You've probably got a couple of questions already. One of them is why am I dressed like I am? Do we, do we have any football supporters in here? Whose colours are these? Norwich. Whose? Norwich. Norwich indeed. Well, <laughs> hate to disappoint you, that's not my club. <laughs> this was actually, um, this is a tribute to my late mother, who was a great Norwich fan. Um, I have to admit that I'm an Ipswich fan. <laughs> Shame. I feel ashamed. We're going down. We're going down to the uh, first division. Then tomorrow is our last game where we play in the championship against Leeds. So I shall be there. We have some Leeds supporters in the hip. <laughs> but the reason I'm here is because I, I care about the North West. Now it may seem very strange that I have a southern accent and I'm one of those southern softies, I guess you could say. But I'm actually not. I'm quite a hard, aggressive businessman, but I have a big heart. Everything I tell you now will be off the cuff and it will be from the heart. And it's how I feel and how I think every single one of you feel after watching the antics of Parliament. It's an absolute disgrace. I'll give you a little bit about my background. I come from a very humble background. One of seven children, three of my sisters are nurses. I was actually at a year old, I was in a caravan in a field. 
I spent a year or two there until the roof started leaking and mum, mum and dad managed to find that we could get a council house. We thought we'd struck gold as all, all seven children lived in that council house, but what a fantastic time we had. I saw everything. I saw Margaret Thatcher give my parents the right to buy their council house. <laughs> I was hugely, hugely proud that that's what the Conservatives gave my parents. And for that reason, I became a Conservative voter. All of my, all of my family, all, all six brothers and sisters and my parents were Labour. So you can imagine I was pretty well outnumbered right the way through. But it didn't change, it didn't change how we were. We'd sit at the breakfast table, sit at dinner, and we'd discuss stuff, and they couldn't, they couldn't get their head around why I was a Conservative. I have to say now, I really do wonder why I was a Conservative. <laughs> I watched my parents go out religiously to vote. Out they go, down the council estate, hand in hand, wind, rain, sun, whatever the conditions, they made sure they went out and voted. And they went out and voted because they actually believed it meant something, that their vote counted. OK, I went out and cast the vote the other way to cancel them out. I said, why don't one of us, each of us, not go? And then just send Dad down out in the rain. <laughs> but they insisted. They insisted that they would go and vote, and it meant a huge amount to them. I now am absolutely disgusted and horrified to think that were these dirty tricks going on, all this time, over all these years, were these dirty deals in the back room being done in Parliament? I believe they were. But I think for the first time, they've now been exposed. <laughs> Thank you for your applause. It means a lot to me. I'm not a politician. I hope that come 23rd of May, I may well be, even if it is for a short time in the European Parliament. <laughs> but I'll just get to why, why I was proud to represent the North West. I've been coming up here for 46 years. I started at my company as an apprentice engineer. 16 years old, I left school with one qualification in maths and uh, that was because I played for the school football team and I got a very serious knee injury and I was uh, on crutches and in plaster and I couldn't do my exams which I thought fantastic. <laughs> I hated school with a vengeance. I was a kid that wanted to be out there. I was black currant picking, potato picking, peas, you name it, I picked it. My parents brought me up with a work ethic, and that's what I've had ever. <laughs> Three paper rounds teaches you a lot. One in the morning, one in the evening, and a Sunday one where you can't even carry the bag and your shoulder's all cut, and it's like, geez. But you have... I'm a real person, and like I say, I'm not a politician, but I had to get involved. There was no, no longer could I stand by and watch and see ordinary people, see my sisters, who, I have to say, they all voted Remain. And I, I've had so many arguments with them. Um, one of my sisters, she's the cleverest one in the family by a mile, her two sons, one's a nuclear physicist, the other is a robotic engineer. Her concerns were, they get all this funding into the UK. This is where it will come through Europe and they won't have jobs and all the rest. Well, I said to her, I don't, I don't buy that argument for a start. Your son's been lecturing in Russia for two years. <laughs> <laughs> he came back from Russia and he went to Australia for three years. 
So I, did, I really didn't buy it. But what, what really, really got to me was the fact of the government frightening people. It was absolutely disgraceful. It's wrong and it should never be allowed. I witnessed all the things that the whole world was going to end, really, if we Brexited. It wasn't going to happen. I think if you can cast your minds back to 1999 and you would remember the year Y2K, what were we told? God alive, I built a bunker at the bottom of the garden. <laughs> I actually did believe that we were going, you know, the whole world was going to end, because that's what we were told, your kettle won't work, your fridge won't work, <laughs> missiles will be going off during the night, everyone was hiding under their beds, I mean, come on. And we've got exactly the same what we're being told now, and it is wrong, and we must not put up with it. We're not fools. <laughs> The problem we have is career politicians. They, re they really have not experienced life. I came from the council estate and damn proud of it. I've gone over, done deals around the world. In fact, six weeks ago, I was in America. If I'd have listened to Mr. Obama, I would never have even gone over there. But do you know what? They welcome you in America, but they are absolutely dumbfounded over how have you got to this situation you're in now? How have you got there? I'm also with an Australian guy who's going to be meeting me next week in uh, California. And he's already been messaging me. He's sitting at a bar in California saying, where's my wingman? And I said, well, I've got some important things to do. I'll talk to you about it when I get over there. But he's mentioned to me Brexit. And what the hell are you guys doing? I mean, the Australians talk straight. And that's, and that's why I admire. It's a pity our politicians didn't talk straight. So you, all you ladies and gentlemen, boys, girls, I can assure you there is absolutely nothing to worry about when we Brexit. I hope you do, because I did, before, before the referendum, my companies were asked to actually um, go down and just tell them what I felt and how the company felt about it. A lot of people were running scared. There was... David Cameron was terrifying people with what he was saying, and it wasn't acceptable. Now, I went round to all those companies and I promised them this, and at the, at the time, about 450 employees around the country, one, one actually in the northwest, um, just outside Manchester in Wilmslow, I have a business. I went, went round those companies and I told them, you have nothing to fear. I said, if we... If we leave and we vote to leave, there will not be one redundancy in our group. Not one. <laughs> However, I did say, if you choose to remain, it's not in my control how we carry on. So. I've got the nod, I've said enough. I just, I just truly, truly thank you for coming here today. I hope you get out there on the 23rd of May and let's give the government a bloody nose. Thank you, Fylde. Isn't he great? Fantastic, Gary. You'll be pleased to know, ladies and gentlemen, also, dressed like that, we appointed him our health and self safety representative for the speakers. <laughs> um, to our, our next speaker uh, is a fantastic lady. She's an activist for free speech. 
she's an author and a pundit for TV. I won't say which channel. You may not like it, but anyway. Um, she also wrote a book. I find that offensive. Please welcome to the stage, Claire Fox. It really is a watershed moment for democracy. The historic question posed to us is whether we're going to let democracy be overturned. As Labour's Tony Benn once said, democracy is the most revolutionary thing in the world. Too bloody right. Without it, we are voiceless subjects. With it, we're citizens with the power to change our destinies. Now is the time to take a step forward and to fight for our votes. Every last one of them. Please welcome to the stage, Claire Fox. It's very exciting to be here. Brexit really has unleashed a fantastic wave of new democratic energy. The, the, thing about, the thing about the Brexit party is that that is capturing that energy and turning it into a new, fresh approach to politics. And it's invigorating and it's really, really exciting. You can tell the Brexit party is a bit different because look at how different all the candidates are. This is a diverse crowd of candidates. Now, I don't know, but in my world, in the media and education, diversity is one of those dread buzzwords. Everything has to be diversity this, diversity that, and there's a lot of box ticking and tut tutting and uh, lecturing and all the rest of it. But you want to see real diversity. Look on this stage and look out there to yourselves. There's all religions. There's all religions. There's all ethnicities. There's all professions. There's all sexual orientations. There's all nationalities. And it's across the political divide. Now, I'm a lefty. And possibly, Anne and I would not agree on everything. <laughs> But let me tell you, on the key issue, the key issue of national sovereignty and popular sovereignty, we are absolutely as one and we are the Brexit party in these EU revenues. <laughs> well, look, with so many uh, interesting characters standing for the Brexit party, dare I mention to Gary, uh, colourful characters. And by the way, I am bitter, Gary, because I thought wearing a fluorescent pink jacket, I couldn't be outdone, but I was. <laughs> but anyway, with so many interesting characters, the commentariat, a lot of the media, they just don't know what to make of us. Because we don't fit into the usual moulds of identikit, machine politicians, parroting lines and parroting spin. Used to be, it used to be that so many of those, of course we know that those in Westminster, those technocrats and MPs, they all kind of like, they're very professional and they do talk the democratic talk but they don't walk the democratic walk. And the thing about the Brexit party is that what unites us is that we walk the democratic walk. But of course the problem is, if you look at us, we're real people with real complicated histories and backstories and interesting lives. And they're gonna throw a lot of bile at us. Just like they did when they threw that bile at you, the electorate, post the referendum. You have had to put up with every vile slur and slander. One of the things which finally drove me over to vote, to stand as a Brexit by candidate, was listening to David Lammy MP on the Mars show. <laughs> 
David Lammy might well be a brilliant MP for Tottenham, but it's on this point that I disagree with him. He went on TV and he said that fellow politicians who were hard Brexiteers, hard Brexiteers means Brexit, no ifs, no buts, Brexit, he said they were worse than Nazis. That means he thinks that we're worse than Nazis. That is utterly contemptuous, offensive, and absolutely must be uh, taken on. But you see, even though, even though all of you have been slandered and called those terrible things, you're here today defiant and we must use every establishment attack on us as an incentive to prove that we, that you, are decent Democrats. We're across the political divide. There are many Remain Democrats, by the way, and we must absolutely stand with them because they stand with us. And all of us will not be intimidated by their attempts at slandering us. It is absolutely and utterly humbling to be here. It's genuinely humbling to be here, to see you, that you've come out and that you're be prepared to be here. I found the whole of the campaign since the referendum to be exactly humbling, but it's also invigorating. But I'll tell you, when the political establishment looks out, they aren't either humbled or invigorated when they look at you lot, by the way. They're absolutely scared, aren't they? You see, let's be honest. Our political elite are not used to having to look the electorate in the eye. They're not used to having to explain anything to us or be accountable to us. They don't hardly know us. They have forgotten the political art of listening to us, their masters, they are our servants, but instead they spent years bubble wrapped in their echo chambers in Westminster and Brussels, talking to themselves, making decisions on our behalf because they think they're better than us. And we're here to say different and remind them that they work for us. Just occasionally, just occasionally, and to give him credit, politicians do go out and meet big crowds. I remember, I don't know if you do, when Jezza, Jeremy Corbyn, went and spoke, no, no, be fair, be fair, no sectarianism here. Anyway, he went out and he spoke at a massive crowd at Glastonbury. Great excitement. Jon Snow from Channel 4 was there saying he's a new kind of politician. He's talking to the masses. But anyway, at that Glastonbury rally, Corbyn quoted Percy Bysshe Shelley's poem, written in 1819, following the Peterloo massacre. But now, here in the North West, with all three North West Labour MEPs backing a people's vote, I say they are a disgrace to the left and a disgrace to the memory of Peter Lou and a disgrace to that Shelley poem. They want to overturn our democratic vote. Those MEPs are insulting the memory of the mill workers and the Democrats who were slain 200 years ago. And they're insulting you by telling you you got it wrong and they want to overturn it. So I want to reclaim Peterloo and reclaim Shelley's poem. And that's what I'm going to start with. We can reclaim Peterloo because rank and file, small groups of leavers throughout the country are organising. And in Manchester next week, there is a march for democracy in memory of Peter Lou and to fight for democracy today. And I will be speaking and I commend those of you who've organised that event. <laughs> but also, let's reclaim the stirring words of Shelley. And I think I might read it worse than Corbyn, but you'll forgive me. <laughs> Rise like lions in unvanquished number. Shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. 
And that's right. We are many, they are few, you are lions, and you remain absolutely unvanquished. I stand in solidarity with you. Vote Brexit Party. We will win. Laura Clare, brilliant. Fantastic. As you can tell, another passionate candidate for these European elections. And so to our penultimate candidate, uh, our last candidate here for the North West, who is, uh, his day job is a dentist, but he's also a trade union representative for tens of thousands of dentists. And in his night job, he is a long-standing Eurosceptic. He was part of the Danish No campaign many years ago, campaigning against the European Union. It's fantastic to have him with us here. Please welcome to the stage, Henrik Overgaard Nielsen. Please welcome to the stage, Henrik Overgaard Nielsen. I think I need to have a word with the organizers here. I think we need to change things because we've got a serious color clash on the last two seats over here. <laughs> Gary did offer to take me clothes shopping, but I have a feeling I might decline. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I'm, Hen <laughs> I'm Henrik Overgaard Nielsen, and I'm Danish. I'm also a dentist. Uh, so with David here as well, I think we can handle most emergencies around here today. <laughs> What is happening in the UK now happened in Denmark in 1992. The Danes voted against the Maastricht Treaty and it will come as no surprise that the establishment did not like the answer the people gave them, so they told us to vote again. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Watching the political drama unfold in Britain, I was worried that the same thing would happen to Britain as it did in Denmark. The arguments in 1992 are the same as the arguments in 2019. The EU has a huge democratic deficit. Brussels is unaccountable, anti-democratic and elitist. Yes. This takes power away from people. A healthy democracy is when you bump into your elected representative in your local corner shop. And most of the people who I hope to represent cannot afford to pay thousands of pounds to lobbyists in Brussels. And isn't it a disgrace that the Labour Party is in favour of this? The Labour Party, which was founded for the purpose of defending working class communities against the elite. And now we find the Labour Party siding with the establishment and turn its it, it back on those very communities. If you look at a place like Fleetwood, which was once England's third biggest fishing port, Come on guys, I didn't get to my point yet. <laughs> Which was once England's third biggest fishing port, employing 11,000 people, it now has no full-time fishermen. Unlike the Labour Party elite, most of whom would not know a fishing boat from a yacht, I have spent many an early winter morning catching cod and eel in the freezing cold Baltic Sea. My family are fishermen in Denmark, 
And I've seen firsthand the devastating effect the EU's common fisheries policy has had. What we need is to leave the EU and re-establish a 200-mile exclusive zone where all the fish belongs to us. <laughs> Norway has done it, and the EU just have to do what Norway tells them to do, because otherwise they wouldn't have any access to those waters. It If we establish that zone, that would mean that we could again catch our own fish and be self-sufficient instead of importing over 40% of the fish we eat, as we do at the moment. But the Labour Party seems so much more concerned with the university lecturers and the residents of Islington than fishing communities in Fleetwood. And this is why it is essential for you to vote for the Brexit Party, because it brings together people from all backgrounds and challenges the dangerous stereotype which media outlets like the BBC push. I did not support Brexit on the basis of a far-right ideology. I am far from the xenophobe Chucker and his chums have claimed make up 17.4 million of their fellow citizens. Ha How will they marry up the idea of me, a socialist, NSS dentist, I have in the 20 years I've worked as an NSS dentist, never treated a private patient. I'm a trade union representative. You're ruining all my punchlines, right? <laughs> I'm a trade union representative who used to live in a commune. How do they marry that up with me being a Brexiteer? Britain is my home. I have brought my, chil I brought my children up in this country, and I've worked and paid taxes here for over 20 years. What happened in Denmark was that democracy was overturned voters ignored and the decision of the people cast aside and I will not let that happen to the country I now call home. <laughs> the Brexit party is the way we can stop history repeating itself and I urge you all to sign up, support and vote for the Brexit Party on the 23rd of May. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Henrik. Thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. And now to our last speaker. You may have heard of him. He needs little introduction uh, to any of us. And without question, he is probably the most influential person to have an impact and a real, real part in history, political history in this country in the last 70 years. You talk about courage, what he's done in the face of abuse, threats to himself and his family has been extraordinary. That continuous commitment to our great country before we welcome Nigel to the stage, let's just see him on the video. We have a parliament that is now completely out of touch with our country. I think politics is broken. Our task and our mission is to change politics for good.
Brexit party has been formed because, very simply, the government and parliament do not wish to deliver Brexit. We are fighting back. The whole of our politics needs changing. The two-party system doesn't work anymore. If they thought we were going to give up, they've got another think coming. This country needs the Brexit party and the Brexit party needs you. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage, Nigel Farage. Congratulations to Filed AFC who won today against Solihull 1-0. Filed are going to Wembley. Well done them. So I hope we brought them some good luck. Now whilst we're in this cheery mood, I want to find out how sympathetic you're feeling today. Because the last 24 hours have been very, very difficult for one individual. And I wonder just how sympathetic you're feeling for Mrs May having crashed in the local elections. Oh. Well, I have to say that what she has tried thus far to sell to the country as Brexit, namely her new European treaty, is such a shameful document that it would only have been signed by a country that had been beaten in war. She has humbled us, she has humiliated us. And my view is that if you think Thursday night was difficult for the Prime Minister, well, you ain't seen nothing yet, let me tell you. Although, of course, you may here in the North West be tempted, perhaps, to vote for Mrs May's Conservative Party. That's the Conservative Party, and she's the Premier that told us 108 times that we'd be leaving on the 29th of March. Remember? Did we leave on the 29th of March? No. Did we leave on the 12th of April? No. Will we be leaving by the 30th of June? No. And do you believe her when she says we'll leave on Halloween day, the 31st of October? No. Trick or treaty, that's what it's come down to. And just to show you how dishonest and duplicitous she and her party are, the man who is topping the list here in the North West for the Conservative Party, Sajid Karim, has come out in the last couple of weeks. He now supports a second referendum and Britain remaining in the European Union. So if you are a Brexiteer and you live in the North West of England, you simply cannot vote Conservative. And what you may ask of the Labour Party. Now, Corbyn's been playing this game of ambiguity, trying to appeal to Remainers in Islington and Leavers up here in Blackpool and elsewhere, neither being one thing nor the other. But here is the truth of it. Slowly but surely, piece by piece, the Labour Party's betrayal of much of its own electorate and its own manifesto promise has been just as bad, if not perhaps even worse, than that which has been done by the Conservative Party. And here, and here, in the North West, there are three sitting Labour MEPs. They're on top of your list here in the North West. And if you vote Labour, 
all three of those Labour MEPs who are up for re-election, all three of them support a second referendum and Britain remaining in the European Union. So let me ask you here in the North West, are you going to vote for those Labour candidates? Thank you. And when you really think about it, you could, I suppose, vote for Chaka Ramuna's party, but I think, I don't think they've really got off the ground. And I suppose, whatever we think of the Liberal Democrats, I guess at least they've been consistent that they want to remain. Lord Adonis, who is now standing, yet yeah, Lord Who was what I thought a few months ago, but Lord Adonis said, if you're a Labour voter if, and you're a Brexiteer, don't vote Labour. So you can't vote Labour, you cannot as a Brexiteer vote for any of the other parties, but there is one party here in the North West that you can vote for, and I want to say, I think what you've seen and heard this afternoon is an amazing array of talented and brave people. And they need, they need your help, they need your support, they really do. You know, when you think about it, that referendum on the 23rd of June 2016 we were told by everybody that the way we voted would be honoured and implemented. Remember that leaflet that David Cameron put through everyone's door? Spent 10 million quid of our money telling us how terrible it would be if we voted to leave, that jobs would go, investment would go. We even had George Osborne telling us there'd be an emergency budget, interest rates would go up, taxes would go up, half a million jobs would be lost immediately. We had President Obama coming across and telling us you know, we'd go to the back of the queue and despite everything, despite all the threats, we the British people voted by a big majority of 1.3 million votes. We voted leave and we knew what we were voting for. If there's one thing, if there's one thing that really drives me mad, it's being told again and again. It's being condescended to, patronised and being told we didn't know what we were voting for. Well, I think we did know what we were voting for. And then it happened again, didn't it? The general election, both big parties said, well, at least their big parties at the moment, <laughs> but we'll come to that perhaps in a second. And both of them in their manifestos promised us, vote for us and we will honour the result of the referendum. And as previous speakers have said, perfectly clear, what the referendum was about, every single leading player on both the Remain and Leave side said the consequence of leaving was that we would leave the EU, the single market and the customs union. So they both promised us they'd honour the result. We then saw 498 MPs voting for Article 50. I have to tell you folks, even I thought at that stage we'd probably won. Because Article 50 said that we were leaving on the 29th of March 2019 with or without a deal. And given, and given that Mrs May's deal is actually a new European treaty that in some ways is worse than the current terms of EU membership, we should have left on the 29th of March with no deal and been free.
There must be no equivocation about this. We want to be able to make our own laws. We want, as Heinrich rightly said, to take back our territorial waters, to bring back tens of thousands of jobs to our fishing communities. We will not have the European Court of Justice telling us what we can and can't do. And as far as the £39 billion pounds Monsieur Barney's ransom that Mrs May wants to pay, well, as far as we and the Brexit party are concerned, they can whistle Dixie for their £39 billion. But you know, this is about more than just leaving the European Union. There is something absolutely fundamental at stake here. Can you imagine if in an African country there'd been an election or a referendum that had been overturned? Many of those in the Remain camp would right now be having fits of the vapours demanding that the United Nations was sent in and that democracy must win through. But here, here in the country that has had a continuous parliament since the 13th century, here in the country that did more than anybody in the world to develop the concept of parliamentary democracy, and then to sell that concept to the post-1945 world with decolonization here in the country that has the mother of parliaments. It is in our very country where the very democratic process has been willfully betrayed by a political class who have acted, in my view, in the most disgraceful, almost treacherous manner. So we are fighting these elections because we're standing up and fighting for the very principle of democracy, for the very principle of self-determination and for the very thing that those generations that went before us made massive sacrifices to defend. It is about democracy. It is about that bond of trust that needs to exist between government and people for a country to operate successfully. It's about how the rest of the world views us. Uh, you know, I, many friends I have in Australia, India, around the world, they simply can't believe what's going on in this country. I've, I've got some American friends. I won't name them, obviously. But I, I've got some American friends who simply cannot believe what is going on. So, ladies and gentlemen, when you leave here today, I want this to be in your minds. We are not asking you on the 23rd of May to simply go out and to protest. This is about more than just fighting back against the establishment. More than that, important though that is. Our ambitions are much higher than they've ever been before. You know, frankly, even if they did force a second referendum upon us, and we won it by an even bigger margin, I don't believe that this parliament and this government would deliver it. I just don't. We have, we have a two-party system that no longer is fit for purpose. A two-party system that is broken. A two-party system that serves nothing but itself. We have a parliament that is out of touch with the nation. We have a civil service who've given up on any idea of being independent, and many of them are now active Remain campaigners. Our system, our system is rotten to the core. And what we need to do, 
is to change politics for good. We need, we need, we need a peaceful political revolution in our country and we are standing here as I say not just for the next three weeks but we're we are going to win back our birthright we are going to win back the ability of our nation to be democratic so I have to ask you are you with us I want you to join us as a registered supporter. I want you to talk to your friends and your neighbours. I want you to take that message out everywhere you go and tell people Britain needs the Brexit party and the Brexit party needs you. Thank you. We're about over time. <laughs> there we are. Thank you. Thank you. Now, as you can, as you can hear, ladies and gentlemen, he hasn't lost his touch, has he? He may have travelled a little bit, but he hasn't lost his touch and his love and his passion for this great country. And we've just got a few questions uh, that are just going to ask before we go. Um, the first one. Uh, is of course Nigel, you know politics is a serious business but the first one is Nigel what's your favourite beer? Yeah. Well now it is true that up until a couple of weeks ago I'd never been photographed in public without a pint in my hand <laughs> this is true however <clears throat> much as I think we need to enjoy life and have lots of fun and goodness me there's quite a lot to laugh at isn't there but actually, I'm taking this campaign so seriously. I realised at Christmas, I'd by no means fought my most serious battle. And right at the moment, Mr Chairman, I'm off the beer, getting fit, because we've got a political class to beat on the 23rd of May and going ahead. You heard it, you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I must be having an impact on him. Um, the next question is for Anne. Anne, are you worried that there'll be a stitch-up by the Tories and the Labour Party on the withdrawal agreement, given the results of the local election? There will undeniably be an attempt at a stitch-up. And we will stand against that attempt. <laughs> And we will make quite sure that if they do try to betray our country with a stitch up, we will have them out at the next election. What I love about Anne is that it's always very clear. <laughs> I call her No Waffle Widdicombe. <laughs> She's absolutely fantastic. Um, Nigel, one question here from Derek from Blackpool. What can we do to get more young people involved in Brexit? Well, one of the good things to do would be to stop the constant bias, prejudice and brainwashing that is going on in British universities. <laughs> Something needs to be done about that. It's outrageous. Outrageous that students are marked down, that students are held up to ridicule because they happen to support Brexit. And I think something is rotten in education. We should be teaching young people critical thinking. They should be making up their own minds on things, not being indoctrinated. However, what I have noticed, despite what many parts of the media will tell you is that increasing young pe a number of young people are coming since the referendum to our side of the argument. There's no question. And it's probably worth mentioning that across the rest of Europe, in Italy and elsewhere, it is the under forces that are voting for the Eurosceptic movements. And I, I have to say, I'm encouraged by that, 
But I have to say, you know, I've, I've worked for a French company, I've married a German woman, I've drunk more Spanish wine than is good for me. I mean, I, I love Europe, but I want a Europe that trades together, cooperates together, acts as next door neighbours living in a street with each other, not a Europe run by an unelected bureaucrat called Juncker. Or Barnier. Or Tusk. Or any of them. We don't want a European Union. We want a Europe of nation states working, trading together, being friends. Wouldn't that be a better future for us and the whole of Europe? <laughs> there we are. I think, I think we're, we know where we are. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Before we go, let's just have us all on our feet with our placards in the air. Let's get a placard. Yeah, I'll get one. What do we want? Brexit. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Brexit. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Brexit. And when do we want it? Now. Thank you very much indeed. Have a very safe trip home.